Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to Reading vs. Listening for Negroes Part 1. And to you, our dear viewer, it is never our intention to offend anyone with our videos. It is not also our intention to suggest, insinuate or preach hate towards any group, race, tribe or person. There is also no propaganda or any deliberate attempt to misinform anyone with our videos. The goal is for you to look for the books, journals, magazines or other publications referenced and study them yourself. Remember, people generally see what they look for and hear what they listen for. Anonymous. And from either B. Wells, the doors of churches, hotels, concert halls and reading rooms are alike closed against the Negro as a man, but every place is open to him as a servant. So have you been following our videos? Do you also read the comments they attract? Do you see comments that see where something is written but still attribute it to us? Do you then wonder why people attribute something they read to us or even others? Permit us then to reproduce some pages and ask questions like, who said what you just read? The Renaissance team? Yourself? Or the author or book you read? Before we go into our topic of today, please permit us to take another look at the Indian and Indian wannabes narrative of how Negroes have now become Indians. Let us quickly look at a website called lostfeather.weebly.com. The URL is somewhere on your screen. So we see what the Indian wannabes and the Indians are trying to do. Remember, we have told you severally that it is the same thing the Arabs did. This is where you hear somebody like Professor Gates telling you that Africans so that Africans. He is supposedly an African American. There is another Dane Calloway, supposedly another African American, telling you you are indigenous. Then there is another group telling you that there is something called Pan Africanism. Then there are the church group, there are the Hebrew Israelite groups. These are all related. That's part of the divide and conquer strategy of the slave master. He just hides behind some of the people to propagate his lies. Please, if you are one of those that think that Dane Calloway should be left alone or that there is an element of truth in what he's saying, remember that he is not working alone. The slave master knows how to hide behind someone and use that person. If you doubt what we're saying, look at some of the sites that have provided alternative and more accurate narrative about what he's saying. You will see that they have just about five or 6,000 views, but Dane has 2 million views. That's because the average Negro does not believe what he is reading. He actually believes what he is told. These are two different things, which is why we are taking time to look at it again and again and again. So our little check shows us that the Lost Feather website, which is purely an Indian website, first debuted around April 2016. And we also discovered that Dane's own site, which is just the one he says, I'm just here to make you think, was first seen around May 2017. So this site alleges that the so-called African slave trade was fabricated. And they cited a book of 1990s written by one Jack D. Forbes, which didn't say that anyway. They just know that the Negroes are not going to go read. Everyone knows that. If you need someone to enslave, just look for the Negroes because it is what you tell them that matters, not what they read. A Negro can read that this thing is blue and you tell him it's white. He will believe what you're saying ahead of what he is or she is reading, provided you are persuasive enough. So we strongly believe that those behind it are Indians hiding behind Dan Calloway. That's why he has mugs and cops and everything because everyone now knows that that's how to get the Negroes. You can either use someone that looks like them or present it as if it's coming from God. Now that those secrets are getting exposed, they look for other ways. We do not believe that Dan is working alone. We believe that there are solidly people behind him. If you doubt what we're saying, one simple way to again look at it is how Professor Gates has been for years telling you that it's Africans that are so that Africans. A, a portion of people believe that. 
before then we were hearing how Africans sold themselves now today he jumps out from nowhere and starts telling you you're Indian and you're also believing so that's very key and that's our reason for trying to show people how to work more with facts than with what they are told read it yourself that's our interest so this site alleges that the tens of millions of Americans in brackets so-called Indians who disappeared after 1492 did not all die in the Holocaust inflicted within America. Many thousands were sent to Europe and Africa as slaves. The whole slave trade myth is that the whole story was given to us in reverse. A mass colony of Africans were not shipped from Africa to America, but the truth is that black Indians were shipped from America to Europe. They were then shipped from Spain to Africa as commodity for African resources. These black Indians, now mistaken as Africans, were shipped back to America and classified as African slaves. The path of our history is what the school system failed to mention in their history programs. Now remember, we continue to tell you that it's likely the Indians, a cabal so to say, are behind it. Then of course the slave master hiding behind them, urging them on. Then they now present them. Everyone knows that to deceive the Negro, just put God to it or use somebody like him. If you notice, numerous sites have debunked what he is saying. But if you still go online, you will see those that claim that he's correct. This is again because the Negro does not believe what he reads. He believes what he is told. These are two different things, which is what makes him a perfect slave. So remember, this is very important. He doesn't ever ask, if you say God said this, where did you see God? That's key. We hope you noticed that the site said tens of millions of Indians. You need to bear that in mind before we go deep into what we're trying to present. So the critical point of this article is the fact that while claiming that it was Indians that were sold, tens of millions, he said, or who, whoever wrote it. Then he goes on to say that the idea that Africans were shipped is wrong and doesn't make sense. Now remember, the person telling you that shipment of Africans from what was Negro land and Guinea does not make sense and is impossible is the same one telling you that it is now possible to ship from Americas to Europe from Europe to Africa then from Africa back to the same America so you see how ludicrous it is but unfortunately like we told you the Negroes take what they are told not what they can read this is why they, there is a, a lot of lies in the church or mosque or anywhere because everyone knows that's the weakness of the Negroes. But let's just move forward to our topic of today. So looking at your screen, assuming the individual continents are something like America for A, Europe for B, and Africa for C, the author is telling us that it's impossible to have shipped from C to A, but very possible to have shipped from A to B, B to C, and from C back to A. So you see how ludicrous it is. Now, please don't get us wrong. The reason we are sounding this alarm and this warning is because we know how the slave master operates. Sometimes in the future, he's going to come up and say, oh, you guys prefer this and just announce it. The same way they change from being blacks to being African Americans. It used to be black American. So they figured that with black American, it makes it easy for them to identify themselves with their siblings in Europe, their siblings elsewhere all over the world. So they now decided to now change it to something like African-American. So from African-American, obviously they want to change it to Aborigine. This is why you're seeing this guy. Believe it or not, that's what's going to happen. They have some plan because if they have changed from Grometers, it used to be Guineans, it used to be Ethiopians. Then it became Negroes, from Negroes to Blacks, from Blacks to African-Americans, from African-Americans to Indians or to Aborigine. That should tell you that there is a plan like that. But let's just move forward to look at other things around that narrative as well. If you look at the book, for example, these are the books showing some Indian Negroes, uh, Indian heroes and things like that. Do you see anyone with the woolly hair, a typical African American there? The answer is no. Now why not ask yourself why then we'll be presenting pictures of Indians instead of so-called African Americans? At least he should have been able to pre present people that look like him. 
So you see that what they want to do is to they want to blend the two and then of course remove the Negro from the equation totally. Let us reference The Mind of the Negro, an intellectual history of Afro-Americans by E.L. A. Thorpe and it was published in 1961. Please note that we insist on documents or publications before 1950 but for some reason we need this to show you how things could change over time. So it says, it is perhaps well known by now that the first Negroes to come to America were not slaves. As servants, laborers, sailors and fighters, they were with Balboa when he discovered the Pacific Ocean, with Cortez when he overthrew Montezuma, with De Soto on his epic exploration, with Mendez at the founding of St. Augustine perhaps even with Columbus, but it was as slaves that they first came in significant numbers, almost a million in the 16th century, almost 3 million in the 17th, and over twice that number in the 18th century. Practically everyone knows too that Negroes were first brought to the English settlements in 1619 and that from Virginia they slowly appeared in all of the colonies. Probably the first slaves to be brought to what is now the United States of America came in 1526. That was a Spanish settlement in South Carolina, headed by the colonizer Lucas Vasquez de Ailon or whatever, and it included about 600 persons, one sixth of whom were Negro slaves. Within eight months, disease, dissension, and Indian hostility caused this project to be abandoned. The Spaniards going to Haiti, while the slaves were left among the Indians, the later thus became the first permanent non-Indian settlers within the present limits of the United States of America. So now you see how that story has changed over time. From being that there were people that existed or that were brought before the so-called 1619 slaves who came, it now became that they are aborigines. That's how the Arifijanism works. That's why we want you to find time to conduct your own research. The slave master understands that it is what the Negroes hear that they believe. This is why he has radios everywhere. Go to Sub-Saharan Africa, go to places like Nigeria and Ambazonia. Everything the state does is to establish a radio station which is controlled by the slave masters. That's why if you notice, the indigenous languages in those places are gradually being stifled and going out of uh, use but the slave masters own values are continuously being propagated by those radio stations bear this very important point in mind remember also that they always tell you that the people were slaves in africa before they were brought to europe or to the americas or to anywhere else and remember also to ask those that are telling you we are all africans today if it wasn't the same africa that they were slaves in and what the difference was. So here it tells us that although it is true that before Negroes were brought to America, they had known slavery in Africa, Arabia and medieval Europe. Nowhere had they known it on such a large scale and with such disregard for anything save the profit motive. Overpopulation and absence of the plantation system in Africa, Arabia and Europe usually had made slavery impractical save as an ornament of wealth but the labor shortage which the occident knew from 1500 a.d to 1900 a.d was the greatest that history had ever known it was to supply this labor need that the negro was brought from africa to america recent research has pointed out that west africa which supplied most of the new world slaves was not as isolated in the Middle Ages as has been popularly thought. And that's our interest for you to see how they present it. But our interest again is for you to ask yourself how the same people could have been slaves to their own siblings if what they are saying is accurate. Now if they were slaves there, why do you now take slaves? Remember, one of the materials told us that it was people with skills that were being taken which this corroborates to a large extent because remember the first people that came were not slaves but skilled men. But let us just move forward. Let us reference a social history of the American Negro being a history of the Negro problem in the United States. 
including a history and study of the Republic of Liberia by Benjamin Brawley and it was published 1921 and there we see the following. In 1521, it was ordered that Negro slaves should not be employed on errands as in general these tended to cultivate too close acquaintance with the Indians. In 1522, there was a rebellion on the sugar plantation in Hispaniola, primarily because the services of certain Indians were discontinued. 20 Negroes from the Admiral Mills, uniting with 20 others who spoke the same language, killed a number of Christians. They fled and nine leagues away, they killed another Spaniard and sacked the house. One Negro assisted by 12 Indian slaves also killed nine other Christians. After much trouble, the Negroes were apprehended and several of them hanged. So you need to bear this very important point in mind. But notice that it says 1521 was when this law was made. Now ask yourself, if the first slaves came in 1619, how could the law be made in 1521? Remember, they were telling us that some slaves or some workers came around 15 something. So these are the things the people are using to say, oh, they are indigenous, which we know they are not. But the essence is how they revise the things to make them look different from what they really were. So if you read between the lines, you will get the concept of it. Now, one of them, one of these Indian wannabes might jump on this bandwagon to tell you that it was to other parts of the Americas but not the United States. Remember, they are so obsessed with the slave master that they love what the slave master has used their forefathers labor to build. Off the back of their slave labor, they don't believe they can build it elsewhere. So this is why you need to understand this about the Negro. So they will be more interested in telling you that this is other places like Jamaica, other places where the Negroes were shipped to, even Europe but not their beloved America. That's the important thing you have to note. So, but let's move forward. And further in this same book, we see where it says, already, however, as early as 1504, a considerable number of Negroes had been introduced from Guinea because, as we are informed, the work of one Negro was worth more than that of four Indians. In 1513, Negroes assisted Balboa in building the first ships made on the Pacific coast of America. In 1517, Spain formally entered upon the traffic. Charles V, on his accession to the throne, granted license for the introduction of Negroes to the number of 400 and thereafter importation to the West Indies became a thriving industry. So you need to bear this in mind. They did it at that time believing that it was something of honor. It was a something of pride. That was why they did it in the name of their religion. The Muslims bragged that they made slaves of pagans. The Christians also did the same thing. So the idea of trying to change that narrative today is coming because the world is now beginning to ask questions. That's just what, what you're seeing. That's why you're seeing this Indian sponsorship of being Indians because they are looking for a way to see how they can somehow condition the next generation to forget the concept or the idea that the slave trade even happened, let alone be attributed to them. Please remember that the slave trade had lasted for almost 200 years before the English joined. And here he tells us that Portugal and Spain having demonstrated that the slave trade was profitable, England also determined to engage in the traffic and as early as 1530, William Hawkins a merchant of Plymouth visited the Guinea coast and took away a few slaves. England really entered the field, however, with the voyage in 1562 of Captain John Hawkins, son of William, who in October of this year also went to the coast of Guinea. He had a fleet of three ships and 100 men and part, partly by the sword and partly by other means he took 300 or more Negroes whom he took to Santo Domingo and sold profitably. So our interest is to show you how the slave master is always proud even when he's lying. You can see how proud the Indian wannabes are. So that's the same thing. If the slave master gets someone to his type of level to lie with pride, 
that's what they enjoy because they know that if a lie is told often enough it begins to look like the truth if you doubt what we're saying just google and see how many people already believe that they are indians you can also try by getting some videos together to claim that actually the so-called african americans are let's say something like um, spaniards or something like uh, even russians and that they were chased away and russia occupied the place you will see that in the next few weeks some people will believe you that's how the negro is he runs after his master he just believes what people are saying even when he reads otherwise it doesn't make sense to him that's the important thing to bear in mind so but our interest is to show you how even as it were at that time it was a very honorable just like oil today you see how the slave master is talking about global warming blaming it on population in africa whereas all the so-called pollutions are coming from his industries which is most unfortunate but well that's again why we ask you to research biafra and ambazonia ask yourself why somebody will be killing others and still be telling those people that they are siblings then you will see the slave master's hand in the game that's one thing we promise you when you conduct that basic research so it goes further to tell us that Hawkins made two other voyages, one in 1564 and another with Drake in 1567. Remember, Drake is a very popular British person, but he was a slave hunter. But you see how they kind of celebrate those that are their own people, even when they did the wrong things. But as far as it favors them, they are okay with it. Now compare this attitude with the Indian wannabes. So they don't do anything that favors their own people. That's the important thing you need to notice. They are always on the side of the slave master, on the side of the oppressor. So he goes further to tell us that on his second voyage, he had four armed ships, the largest being the Jesus, a vessel of 700 tons and a force of 170 men. Now ask yourself, if 170 military men are going and somebody is still telling you that it was a cell, does that really make sense to you if he was a cell why are they going with the army that's why they have the armies in west africa today those armies were the slave hunting terror groups this is where the why the fulani is having all the hair they they can murder wipe off a community you will notice that the slave master keeps quiet so in our subsequent edition we shall show you what is going on so that you will understand it yourself and you will see why they are doing what they are doing the slave master is also solidly behind them now remember when you talk they will say oh it's the same nigerians we are all nigerians that's the same game everywhere we are all africans we are all indians is the one they are working on now remember when the fulanese want to oppress others they will tell you it's the same nigeria we're all nigerians we're entitled to this we're entitled to that if you notice for those who still don't understand the game in nigeria today you can ask anybody the Fulani wants to take public funds because they own the place with the slave master, the Europeans, the Americans hiding behind them. They own the place. Uh, apparently, the agreement is we take the resources, we give you weapons. That's what it looks like, which we shall show you in subsequent editions. So now, they have millions of people ravaged by Boko Haram, created by them in the north. They have not resettled them. They are still living in internally displaced people's camps, but the Fulani wants to take millions of public funds and establish their presence in every community in that whole sub-region. Remember, they don't bring anything called development. You can't bring, you can't show us any invention anywhere by them. All they do is the slave master hides behind them to propagate his lies and of course unleash terror on the people. Now we will challenge you on something when we finish on the weapons being shipped to Saudi Arabia so that you understand what the game is all about and who the proxy is. So it goes further to say December and January 1564 to 65 he spent in picking up threat and by sickness and fights with the Negroes he lost many of his men. Now remember the Negroes fought back. But unfortunately, the enemies right there within what was Negro land and Guinea were the problem. So when you think that, for example, why not ask yourself how the weapons made by the Europeans Americans go to cause their damages in sub-Saharan Africa? It is those enemies that the armies you have there 
are the same slave hunting terror groups which we shall continue to show you so he goes further to tell us here that then at the end of january he set out for the west indies he was becalmed for 21 days but he arrived at the island of dominica march 9. he traded along the spanish coast and on his return to england he touched at various points in the west indies and sailed along the coast of florida on his third voyage he had five ships he himself was again in command of the jesus while drake was in charge of the judith a little vessel of 50 tons he got together between four and five hundred negroes and again went to dominica he had various adventures and at last was thrown by a storm on the coast of mexico here after three days he was attacked by a spanish fleet of 12 vessels and all of his ships were destroyed except the judith and another small vessel the minion which was so crowded that 100 men risked the dangers on land rather than go to sea with her so but our interest is for you to see how the slave master celebrates evil that's the best way we can explain it and you're gonna see what we mean shortly so right here you see where it says it is noteworthy that in all that he did Hawkins seems to have had no sense of cruelty or wrong. So you see, at that time, most of them were into slave hunting and slave trading as if it was a noble business, as if it was something good, justified. So you see, he goes further to say, he held religious services morning and evening, and in the spirit of the letter Cromwell, he enjoined upon his men to serve God daily, love one another, Preserve their victuals, beware of fire, and keep good company. Queen Elizabeth evidently regarded the opening of the slave trade as a worthy achievement, for after his second voyage, she made Hawkins a knight, giving him for whatever. But at, at our interest is the fact that somebody who was a slave hunter is also a knight in the church. The name of the ship was called Jesus. So you understand how the whole thing works. Likewise, the Muslims. They were doing their own thing. They were the captors, actually. Now, the mere fact that the Negroes fought back should tell you that it couldn't have been a sir. That's the thing you have to bear in mind here. There's no way you can walk to an able-bodied man, his wife, his children, his bands, his yams, his uh, everything. He abandons it and agrees to be sold without force. Then, then, the reason they use Professor Gates to tell you that they make wars is because they know that when they use somebody that looks like the negroes the negroes believe the lies there is no way they can make laws because if you looked at that time there were no roads it was just footpaths there were people living in small small communities here and there so for you to even make wars according to them they told you that the negroes were naked they were conducting human sacrifices and all that they were naked living on trees now tell us how did they make the wars you are going to say, oh, they give them guns. If you are shot, let's say, on the leg, or you see somebody coming to shoot you as well, how will the slave be available after the shooting? It's either you shoot him or he shoots you. So if you get wounded, how do you take the slaves? If it was something as simple as the way they are putting it. But they understand that when a lie is told often enough, it begins to look, to look like the truth, which is what they use Professor Gates to do. Now you will notice how they are going to sell this Indian dummy. That's why we always talk about it. So that you keep watching how they are going to ultimately sell it. Why not ask yourself, in a place like Nigeria for example, when they are killing people, you keep hearing Boko Haram or you see the slave master now talking about the same conquest they have been on with the Fulbi or Fulani. They tell you it's herders and the farmers clash. That's their way. They create the crisis. They now come in with something that will look like a solution, whereas they are behind the crisis. We will explain this further, either in this edition or in subsequent editions. So going further, you see that the queen made him a knight and given him for a crest, the device of a negro's head and bust with the arms securely bound. So you see that he was made a knight for being a glued slave merchant. But there you are today, claiming that your forefathers did it. Some so-called African Americans believe that their own forefathers were sold by their siblings. So this is where the irony comes in and that is why they are going for that Indian narrative. 
Remember, this is something the slave master has learned, looking for a way to wipe, wipe his hands off. So it goes further to say France joined in the traffic in 1624 and then Holland and Denmark and the rivalry soon became intense. So it was a very brutal thing. This is why you notice that they all say, say the same thing today against the Negroes. That's why we always challenge you to find out who the Negroes are. You notice that the non-Negroes in what is Africa today will not condemn the killings. They will not say anything about the killings. They will only be telling you why, who and who are also all Negroes. So you see, but they will never condemn the fact that weapons are being shipped to the fools they have in what is sub-Saharan Africa today. Now, if you want to understand who the Negroes are, the woolly hair is a very key thing to look at. If you have a modern-day Ethiopian around you, look at them, you will see that they don't have woolly hair. That's right there shows you that the Ethiopia of today is not the same as the one of those days. But we're going to just move forward with our topic of today. So please remember we said we're going to read a few things and ask you who actually said whatever we are reading, whether it is us or the book or the author of that book. So but before we continue, remember we have always told you that the slave trade is still going on but subliminally. So if we referenced illusion, so we see a little diagram there that tells us what it was like during the slave trade and what it's like today so that you understand whether or not the slave trade is still going on. So then they could buy any number of slaves with English spirits, a gun and some trifles. And then they would get like 200 slaves which included men, women and children. Now remember, they know where the fools live which we are going to ultimately show you as well. If you have not decoded where they live already so now you see during the slave trade era they now devised a means of exchange called the cowries which are just pieces of junk so they give them these pieces of cowries in return and weapons anyway in return for any number of slaves remember they don't count it like the oil today in places like nigeria there's no measure for it all they need is to provide enough weapons to the fools they have there then they take the oil now if you go as a negro if you decide to go and ask those people you call your fellow africans for food or for job you will see what will happen now we challenge you if for those of you in so-called nigeria sub-saharan africa what was negro land and guinea when you say oh we are all africans one of the challenges we have posed for you is when those in biafra those in ambazonia ask for something like building their roads or their schools or even allowed it, allowing them to build it now you keep quiet they will deploy an army we i challenge you today when the army goes to like raid a civilian's house over nothing like the nigerian army why do you not ask yourself who gave that order somebody must have given the order now remember when we remind you that the army was the slave hunting terror group his duty in sub-saharan africa is not to conquer nations for anybody because they have no mandate their mandate is to sustain the legacy of the slave trade which is what they do that's why when you agitate for freedom they are the ones to go it's not the police it's not the let's say civil defense or anybody it is the army and they are expected to strike with lethal force they are expected to strike with terror as a deterrent to other people not to ask for freedom that was the same thing they did during the slave trade you can investigate how quakers were treated at that time if you doubt us investigate so that's what the army does to you today if you doubt us they claim they have what they call their democracy there why not ask yourself if you go and talk to biafra or ambazonia you see the army deployed the slave master will turn the other way the slave master will deploy his own propaganda machinery in defense of their foot soldiers because the foot soldiers are basically fools. They have no common sense. You will ask yourself why the slave master will come and steal somebody from you, use the person to make products and sell those products to you in return for weapons and for you to slaughter your siblings. So you see that they definitely have no iota of common sense. So you see that in the present day today, you see that slaves are replaced by natural resources like crude oil from Boni and Calabar, which were major slave ports at that time. They may not tell you this, but if you research, you will see it. So now, what do they exchange for the oil? They exchange the oil with colored paper, 
which you can see it looks like a dollar or pounds or euro and then of course they are ready to kill any number of negroes over it we are suspecting that in the no distant time there's going to be a major bloodshed because this slave master that is hiding behind the fulani telling them about ruga and how to establish colonies in other people's property but when you a negro wakes up to say we don't want to be in the same country with you we are not the same people they will take the guns from the slave master and slaughter them in their numbers we're not talking of five or ten people so that when you are shouting and thinking that you are all africans those people are just lies they are telling you to deceive you there is nothing like we're all africans if you think we're all africans when they start killing others remind them and see what they tell you they, you will discover that the slave trade is still very much alive and well but let's just move forward let us reference atlas geographos or a complete system of geography ancient and modern for africa volume 4 published 1714 and there we see the following their king is reckoned far more potent than he of congo has ten kings for his vassals and commands a country of such a vast extent that if we may believe Depa, 200 men are daily killed in his palace some of whom are criminals and others slaves of tribute and the king and court dine upon their flesh after it's dressed though they have plenty enough of cattle and other provisions now our interest is to ask you again is it us that said this thing now that you're reading or the book we're reading or the author that's our simple question to you and our reason for asking you this is when we analytically look at what is written and present our own path some people come to say oh you said we didn't say that's why we always show you the book you go read it yourself and if you have problems with it you contact the author that's as simple as can be the authors are the people that wrote it we only present them to you for you to see because we understand that the negro only believes what he hears not what he reads so that is why you notice that they challenge us for saying what they can read themselves but because the negro does not believe what he is reading he instead believes what he heard he believes we said even when they are looking at where we read it from oh, this is very important for you to note now if you were to get the book illusions you will see where a calculation was done about these 200 men being killed per day to show you that it's a lie but the slave master understands that the moment he writes it his people know what it means they will now start propagating it the negro just believes what he hears he doesn't analytically look at anything now if you were killing 200 every day and the gestation period of man is nine months so how long will it take for that community to finish that's a calculation people should be doing in schools today to show that the slave master is a liar let us also reference the American Journal of Sociology, Volume 11, September 1905, Number 2, The Negro Race and European Civilization by Paul S. Resk, and it was uh, published 1905. Now remember, we have always told you that when they finish developing anywhere, they will now try to change the identity of the Negroes in order to make it look like the Negroes made no contributions. This is very key. If you are a good scholar, investigate or research it or however you want to put it just dig into what we have just said so now you see what he tells us right here that negroes have come in contact with the worst side of european civilization yet their buoyant vigorous constitution and their fundamental common sense carry them safely through dangers which have proved fatal to other races they are therefore destined to be a permanent element in the composite population of the future and when we consider the extent and fertility of the regions which they hold the necessity of their ever increasing cooperation in the economic life of the world becomes apparent the negro race may be studied in four different sets of conditions in their original state in the forests of central africa as a mixed race under the control of the arab and Hamite races of the northern Sudan, living side by side with a white population in respect to which they occupy a socially inferior position as in South Africa, 
and North America and in a few isolated communities which enjoy rights of self-government based upon European models as in Haiti and in the French Antilles. A correct understanding of any part of the Negro question demands a review of the situation of the Negro under all these varying conditions because only through a comparison of the aboriginal characteristics of the Negro with the qualities acquired through contact with other races and civilizations can we form a just estimate of his relative capacity for progress. So now remember at that time Negroes were considered animals. Our interest is to show you how the Negroes developed Europe. The reason they are going with this Indian narrative now is because America is a done deal. They now want to change the narrative and the identity of the Negroes one more time. So look at this portion very well for those who think they are all Africans. It says, as we pass from Morocco or from Cairo toward the center of the Sudan, the color of the population gradually grows darker and their features from the regular and often beautiful type of the Hamite merge off into the coarser characteristics of the Negro race, from the pure white skin of the Barber to the yellow of the Tuareg, the copper tint of the Somali or the Fulbi. Remember the Fulbi, we said they were not Negroes and some people were fighting us and saying, oh, it's a lie, we are all Africans, you are dividing us. But notice that those people that say you are dividing us do not ever condemn the killings going on there. That's one thing you have to ask yourself. Who are those people that keep saying you are dividing them when they are not united in the first place? So you see how the division is done and it says the chocolate of the Mombutu and the ebony of the Jalof. The color gradations are imperceptible and no conception is more utterly mistaken than that which would people all of Central Africa with a black skinned race. That shows you that there are different colors but they know who they wanted. The Negroes are not as dark as they claim. They are usually a bit on the brownish side. If you doubt what we're saying, if you were to talk to someone who is ignorant of any of these things we are talking about here, they are going to tell you something like the Igbos are yellow. It's not that they are yellow, that is the conditioning the slave master did at that time. They were to tell them what they were looking for. Remember, the slave master is dealing with a bunch of fools who were catching the slaves for them. If you doubt what we're saying, we can give you a little scenario so that you can understand. There is a company in Nigeria owned by an Igbo man that manufactures cars. But the slave master wants that car company closed and he has been walking through the Fulani to close it. Now, the same Fulani wants to establish cattle ranches that is their business that doesn't help anybody. In fact, red meat is detrimental to health. If everyone knows, cow milk is detrimental to babies whether you want to believe it or not because if you were to study materials you will discover that the negroes never gave their children cow milk they considered it something unthinkable to give babies calf milk until the slave master found a way to force them to have it and of course put it in the bible as well which we shall ultimately show you now the car company can give more people jobs than the cattle rearing but the slave master understands this and the reason the slave master does that is because that is the only bet he has for the fools he has in sub-Saharan Africa, which we shall show you. Remember, there is a reason behind closing it. Because they know that if you can feed well, they can't enslave you anymore. So their duty is to keep you hungry so that when they give you a little food, you will believe they are lies. That's actually what the game is all about, which we shall show you where it's documented as well. And of interest is where it says the question of race mixture between Europeans and Negroes is however at present of little practical importance. In the regions where large numbers of Europeans and Negroes live side by side, the social laws more and more stringently forbid a mixture of the two elements. Moreover, the number of Europeans who settle in Central Africa will probably always be exceedingly small. And again, our question now to you is, what we just read, is it us that said it, or the journal we read, or the author of that journal? That's our interest. Remember, we told you in this path that for each of those things, we will ask questions as in, 
were we the ones that said it? Of course not. But you know the Negro listens to what he is told but does not believe what he reads. So let us reference letters and sketches from Northern Nigeria by Martin S. Kish and it was published in 1910 with an introduction by Sir Percy Gerard and there we see the following. After a stay in Kano, the expedition turned towards Sokoto and in October came upon Belo who was attacking the capital of Gobe with an army of 60,000. Note the number of troops because it's the same troops they used or converted to what you call Nigerian army to pacify the Fulani and stop them from slave raiding. Notice that it says Belo. Belo was a former sultan of the Fulani. That stool is today known as the Sultan of Sokoto, which is still in Nigeria today. Again, our question to you is, why do you think your Professor Gates never goes there to ask them about the slave trade? He instead goes to small children born in the 60s and 50s and 70s to ask them of the slave trade. That's because he is a controlled scholar. The slave master knows that to deceive the Negro, just use someone like him or add God to the narrative. That's all you need to do. So he goes further to tell us that Clapperton wished to proceed from Sokoto to Bornu. These are all in Sokoto. When you hear Boko Haram, that's where the capital of the place. Remember the fool lives there. So that's why the place is in turmoil. It has always been in turmoil because the fool and he conquered the houses and converted the place to a field of blood. So he goes further to say but Bello put all sorts of obstacles in his way, so he stayed on at Sokoto and there fell ill and died. Landa, having buried his master, set out again for the coast and arrived eventually back at Badagri, the starting point of the expedition. Now remember at that time, there were no cars, there were no real roads in those places, just footpaths. So they were moving with horses. They were dangers of even wild animals. And remember the Negroes will always go into the thick bush to hide away from the slave hunters. So when he says they are being attacked by a troop of 60,000, you're going to think, oh, how does he know? How could he have counted them? It was the same army they converted to what you call your Nigerian army. That's why Nigerian army is older than the country. It was to stop them from killing. If you doubt us, go to Nigeria today. You see they are still killing. They now claim that if you want us to stop killing, give us Ruga. What does Ruga mean? They want to now live in every community. And normally when they get that, what they will do is, they will use the army and protect that Ruga. Then they come out from within that Ruga, massacre a community and then go back inside there. The community will just shout and keep quiet. The slave master knows this. So the weapons you see the slave master shipping to Saudi Arabia, the Saudi Arabians are proxies to them. So they will now ship it to, back to them. Why not ask yourself when the Americans claim they are fighting with Muslims? Then I, or not fighting with Muslims, but they pretend to be. But they ship weapons to Saudi all the time. If you were to check your records, you will see that they all did it. So, but our interest is for you to see the game right here. So you see the number of troops. He wasn't attacking the place for anything. They don't attack you because they want to steal your property. They attack you to pillage, to destroy, to kill. At that time, it was to capture slaves. It was something they did with a lot of pride. So again, our question to you here is, did we say what you just read? Or it is the author that said it? Or the book? Which one? We want your answer in the comments section. So here again, you see where it says, On the deaths of Sultan Belo. Sultan Belo was a former Sultan of Sokoto. It's a Sultan of the Fulani. They named it to Sultan of Sokoto because they normally masquerade as we are all this. While, of course, enslaving and yoking the Negro. So it goes further to say, Of his strong opponent in Bornu, both of them died. Followed a period of civil wars, Bornu was invaded from the north. In both countries, the pagans sought to make good their independence and the deposed Hausa chiefs in the Sokoto Empire tried to cast off the rule of the Fulani. Note this very well. The country suffered from devastation, dislocation of trade and above all, slave raiding. Bello's successors were weak, cruel and self-indulgent. The people were oppressed by extortionate taxation and petty despotism and the system of justice degenerated. 
the Mohammedans no longer attempted to convert the pagans of the south. Note this very well, southern Nigeria, they no longer converted them to Islamism, but they instead, but merely raided them for slaves and the state of the country when it came under British rule was truly deplorable. Remember, this is something they are writing. Now, we challenge you again to ask, is it us saying this or the book? Or the author of the book that's our simple question to you remember some people will come here and say oh you don't like the fulani you don't like the fulani but they can read the same thing so our question to them is can't they read or is it that we shouldn't read or because the story doesn't favor them we shouldn't read it we don't understand that's why we're asking this question please if you know the answer we would want you to put it in the comment section that this is why somebody will read something somewhere he knows the author he won't go to the author, he won't go to the publisher of the book, he will come to blame us for reading what he too read. So just below the highlighted portion, you see where it says, it was not till the 19th century when the Fulani Empire was already established that the countries of the Western Sudan were discovered by Europeans, shut off from the north by the vast west of the Sahara and from the south by a broad belt of impassable jungle they had since the decadence of the moors lost all touch with foreign civilizations from the middle of the 15th century the discoveries of the portuguese had brought europeans to the west coast but owing to the barbarity of the natives they did not penetrate far inland now again we ask you the portuguese explored as far east as the swamps of the niger delta and laid the foundations of the overseas slave trade which was only finally abandoned in the 19th century so you see how after raiding the place for years since the 1434 thereabouts that the portuguese you see how they are now making the portuguese look like they are not europeans if you read that thing again you will see that it says it was after the portuguese did something that brought the Europeans are the Portuguese not Europeans but you see how the slave masters books work so you need to read between the lines now if we were saying something you have to also look at what they wrote again we ask you is it us that is saying or the book that we are reading that you are listening to that's again part of why we are making this video we cannot go too long further but we're gonna try one more material before we round up let us also reference travels in the interior districts of Africa performed under the direction and patronage of the African Association in the years 1795, 1796, and 1797 by Mungo Park, Sojourn, and it was published 1799. And there we see the following. The Fulas of Bandu are naturally of a mild and gentle disposition, but the uncharitable magazines of the Quran has made them less hospitable to strangers and more reserved in their behavior than the Mandingos. They evidently consider all the Negro natives as their inferiors and when talking of different nations always rank themselves among the white people. Again we ask you, what you just read now, did we say it or you saw where we read it from and you read it too? Or is it from the author of the book or the book itself? Please, if you have an answer for this question, please put it in the comment section. Let us round up by looking at something very interesting. So let us reference notes on Northern Africa, the Sahara and Sudan. And it was by William B. Hodgson and it was published in 1844. And there we see the following. The Fulas are not Negroes. They differ essentially from the Negro race in all the characteristics which are marked by physical anthropology. So our question again to you is, did we say what you just read now or the book says it or the author of the book? Again, put your answer in the comment section. So let us round out by asking you some of these few other questions. You can see on your screen that Clinton, when he was US president, shipped a lot of weapons to Saudi Arabia. You can notice the date is 1993. And here again, you see that Bush announces 20 billion arms deal for Saudis. This was in 2008. And here we see that Obama administration arms sales offers to Saudi top $115 billion. So our question to you is, 
Do you know where these weapons end up? And here we come to the end of this edition of Reading vs. Listening for Negroes Path 1. We hope we have been able to enlighten you and we also hope we have been able to challenge you to find time to conduct your own research. We hope we have also been able to get you to separate what the books and records are saying from what we are saying. We are not saying it simply because we are reading it. We thank you very much for listening and we do hope you will find time to conduct your own research. Peace.